Well, Happy New Year. Okay, just want to make sure. Let's start off with a little. It's good to be here. I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad that you're here as well. It was nice to have a little bit of change of rhythm, uh, a different routine, some uh, time with family for a few days. But it's, it's good to get back to our usual place and to be in this place with you. It, it's really kind of hard to believe it's 2018, isn't it? I mean, a new year, and we blink our eyes, we'll be here again, right? Um, but here it is. Now, I was not with you last Sunday, so I don't know how you prepared for your New Year's Eve uh, to know how many of you made New Year's Eve resolutions. Are you, are you resolution maker? Yeah, some. Are you, are you here? Yeah, yeah. Seems like some of you are resolution makers. Some of you are not. Um, uh, about 60% of Americans make New Year's Eve resolutions. Um, and, and so um, uh, New Year's Eve resolutions, the most common ones are things like health, uh, exercise, weight, uh, our spending habits, self-improvement, relationship things. Odds are that some of you made some of those very same resolutions last Sunday. Uh, given our, our sort of normal attendance, if, if we're statistically average, about 250 of us made uh, at least one resolution. And statistics would indicate that about 150 of us made more than one. We made multiple resolutions, lots of resolutions. Do, do you know how many people feel successful at that process on a, on a, in an average year? L like 9%. 9% look back at the year. When the year is gone, they look back. So at the end of, when 2018 is over, 9% on average will look back and say, I did it. Wow, I, I did what I set out to do. Just, just less than 10%, 9% are, are successful. Uh, studies show that 25% of uh, resolutions have already been broken. We're seven days in, 25% are done. Another 5% will quit this week and 10% more before January is over. And, and I'm sure somebody's thinking, well, that's why I don't make New Year's resolutions, because they just don't amount to anything. But the interesting thing is, I read this, it was kind of interesting. People who make resolutions are 10 times more likely to achieve their goals than those who don't. So even though only one in 10 will accomplish their resolutions, they are 10 times more likely than those of us who might just sit the whole thing out and say, well, I, those resolutions, they never amount to anything, so I'm not, I'm not going to do it at all. The bottom line, change is hard. Change does not come easy, and we fail more than we succeed. But still, looking at a fresh set of calendar pages, uh, we get hopeful. I mean, uh, you view the, or if you go to outer space and you look at the Earth's turning on its axis and its revolution around the sun, there is nothing unique about January the 1st. It's like any other day. But when you get to turn over and you have a clean calendar, 365 days of promise and possibility, it, it, it gives us a sense of hope to think things could be different. And, and that very act of thinking about it, even to speak of resolutions, to say, this is what I'm going to do, that, that brings a sense of, of instant gratification. Now, the problem is, if, it's sort of like if you go and go to the furniture store and you, you buy a new sofa only because there are no payments for a year. That, 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 that bill is going to come due. And making a resolution and keeping it, as we know, are two totally different things. Ninety percent of us can attest to the fact that, that those are really different. The vast majority of us fail. And those of us who, who sit the whole thing out, we're even less likely to make change in life. So what happens is we keep going around the calendars and we keep struggling with the same things. We keep facing the same thing over and over again. The same issue. We might try to change only to fail again. 
Think about your own personal journey. In your life, what is the one thing that you wish was different? What is the one thing that you want to change in, in your life? For some of us, it, naming it is easy because it's the last thing you think about before you go to sleep and it's the first thing on your mind when you wake up in the morning. It could be lots of things. Maybe your struggle is addiction. Maybe it's alcohol or drugs or gambling. Maybe it's too much food. Maybe it's putting down the phone and the videos and picking up the books and becoming a serious student. It could be lots of things. Maybe, maybe your struggle is spending less. Maybe it's a generational thing. I've, I've become a workaholic j just like my father or, or divorce runs in my family and I'm living into that, it seems, at this very moment. Or, or my mom couldn't keep friends and I can't seem to either. What, 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 what is your one thing? Take better care of your body given to you by God to be faithful in your relationships, to get finances in order, to make better grades, to stop drinking. The list is endless, but what's your list? What's your one thing? And how many times have you said, I'm going to deal with this now? We're starting 2018. We want to deal with these things head on. For six weeks, we're, we're going to talk, think, and pray about our one thing. And it's our hope and it's been our prayer and will continue to be our prayer that God will use this time to guide us to success. And let's be clear, it's not just about self-improvement. As worthy a goal as self-improvement is, we want this to be about more. I would suggest it's a biblical imperative there are many places in the Bible that speak to what we are about in the new year. Paul, for one, in Romans said, you know what time it is. Time to wake from sleep. The hour has come to, for us to cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. It, it's time. The prophet Isaiah said, remember not the former things, but behold, I am doing a new thing. The new creation Paul speaks of in the letter to 2 Corinthians. Behold, I am doing a new thing. He says the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. God desires the best for you and I. We don't want to miss God's best. So what can we do? What can we do different than we've done it before to finally deal with our one thing? How can we do it so that we will succeed this year? For one, let's make sure it's one thing. Change is hard enough not to try to tackle seven things. So the question is not, what are your 11 things, but what is your one thing? Granted, we might have more than one thing we want to deal with, but, but the way to success is to focus. What, what is your one thing? Because some of us undermine our propensity to succeed by, by trying to do too much at one time. So the question is, What's your one thing? Another huge factor that will determine whether we succeed or fail is whether we try to do it alone or not. You and I were created for community. We are at our best when we are in relationship. Remember, remember the Genesis story, Genesis 2, 18. It is not good for man to be alone. We were built to do life together. In the letter to the Hebrews, it says, let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage one another. It's the same advice that the sage of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes wrote centuries before when they wrote that two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If one falls, there's one there to lift him up, but woe to the one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. So it is that to go through life, to have real change, we need real people doing real life with us. We need to be together. Transformation takes more than just information. We need community. We need people there to encourage us, to, to call us to accountability, to pray for us, to ask hard questions. It's the role of small groups and Sunday school groups and choirs and other places where we meet together so that we can encourage each other. So I want to encourage you to be here. 
I, I hope you will commit for the next six weeks that you'll be present. That you'll be present, that we will be together in worship, that we'll come to Sunday school or find your place. I hope that our youth will commit to be in youth on Sunday nights because you can't do life together if you're not together. It's impossible. And our potential success is based on being together because the truth is, is that you might be the answer to someone else's problem. God might use you to help me, and if we're not together, then that connection might, might not happen. So one thing, together. That, that's what we are to be about is what is our one thing, and let's tackle it together. And those things are very important, but alone they're not enough. If all it took was picking one thing and telling all our friends about it, a lot more people would be successful with their resolutions and with change and and it's not that easy, and here's why. We're not, we're not machines. We're not computers. We, we can't be programmed, and then boom, we just do what we want to do. It's not unlike what Paul wrote to the Romans. I, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do not do what I want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that anything good that dwells with, nothing good dwells within me in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not is what I do. Any of you ever been there? I plan to do this, but it doesn't happen. I've said I'm not going to do that, and here I am again. And so it is. We live in a fallen world. To use the computer metaphor, we've been hacked. We've been infected with a virus, and we're trying to do one thing, but then all of a sudden this other thing happens. So we make bad choices, and we repeat them over and over. We want to do the right thing, but we don't. The writer of Proverbs in chapter 14, verse 12, says it this way. There's a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of death. What that means is, is that we can't ch trust ourselves to choose wisely. That's why we need others. That's why we need community. That's why we need guidance. We need help. And God knew that. God knew that long ago. That's why when Jesus was getting ready to leave the earth, he said to the disciples then, and to you and I now, I do not leave you orphaned. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, will teach you everything and remind you of all I have said to you. Peace I live, leave with you. My peace I give to you. So as we start this new year, we commit ourselves, we begin again the, the job, the work of making space for the Holy Spirit to grow in us. As we begin the year, I, I invite you, whether for the first time or just again, the most recent time, to invite God's Spirit into your life. And by worship and prayer and the reading of Scripture by meeting together with other Christians, we, we grow the ability to hear and to feel the promptings of God's Spirit that we can be guided to God's best for us. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul explains how we get there. He calls it the fruit of the Spirit. When the Spirit lives and grows in us, then these things come to be in life. You remember that list? The gifts of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The things we need in our life. When the Spirit lives in us and grows in us, those things become more present. It's still hard work. We, we have to stay focused. We have to, to stay diligent in our work. It doesn't just happen. Uh, unlike that furniture that we might not have to pay for for a year, this is work that means that we pay for it every hour of every day of every week to get there. It's continually. But prayerfully, Prayerfully, listening for God's guidance, I, I invite you to think about what's your one thing in 2018? Is it stewardship of your body? 
uh, that's been given to you by God? Uh, Are you going to deal with maybe struggles you've had with self-confidence or your self-image? Is is your one thing dealing with fear that holds you back or forgiveness that you need to forgive yourself or you need to forgive somebody else? Is God calling you maybe to be more open-minded or is God calling you to set and keep priorities? Is the Spirit prompting you to become more prayerful or more a student of the Bible, more present in worship, more engaged in mission? Is God calling you to think about your life? Are there things that in your way of living that, that they might not be wrong, but they're not God's best for you? And that God is calling you to something more. Now, I've already asked you, to be present, to make the commitment to be together. But I want to ask you to do something else too. I want to ask you to pray. I would challenge the church to pray every day uh, for your own journey around your one thing, but also for the rest of us. Pray for others uh, to stay the course. Pray for the right people to be in these seats week in and week out to to hear from God and to receive encouragement. Pray pray for the right people and the right conversations to happen at work and at school and in the carpool line so that the right people get connected with God's power in a transformational way. So I invite you to pray. In in a moment, we're going to come to this table the table of Christ's sacrifice. And I I think it is the only place to start a journey like we are starting in 2018. First of all, because when we come to this table, we are aware of God's love in a way unlike any other place. That before any of us were born, Christ was born, entered our world, lived our life, and died that we, we might not be lost. And that's clear testimony of God's love even before we were born, even before we commit to try to make this change in our life. God says, I love you. So it doesn't matter how hard we try. It doesn't matter whether we succeed or not. God loves us. And this table is proof positive of that. The other thing this table says is that we're forgiven. That that grace is enough for your sin and, and for mine. And so we don't start this journey, we don't move into this motivated by guilt or by fear. We move into this new year motivated by God's love and God's grace and that God wants the best for us. So in a few minutes as we come to the table, I invite you to think about it this way. Be aware of God's great love for you and of your forgiveness that you have been set free from from all guilt and sin. Come to this place prayerfully. Come to this place thinking and asking God for help with your one thing. You might want to make a commitment. You might want to pray about it at this altar rail or back at your seat. but, But let's come aware of God's grace, moving into this new year, taking on the one thing that's between us and God's best for us. And may God add his blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.